Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, Lars and Bjorn, for bringing me here. It's my third visit to Singapore, and it's the first to NTU. But part of the research actually was carried out by a postdoc who, who is now working at NTU and who was previously in my lab. So what we are interested in is polyelectrolytes for making materials out of them. And materials is a very general term. But maybe I should say one more thing because you announced it so uh, that NTU is a great place to be at. So you can take it as a lecture for becoming professor here. So that's, an, that's actually a job interview for me. So now, let's, let's move in. Uh, Bio-inspired nanocomposite materials with complex anisotropies. Um, anisotropic materials, and that's very briefly for the community, is something that I find very highly interesting in nature. It's everywhere. We have in hard science the problem that they are very difficult to characterize. We were lacking for a long time. We were lacking the right methods for doing that, and we have started out. So uh, my definition for material science uh, is actually that the challenges to be found are in two areas. It is about mat transforming matter into something more useful. And uh, that's what we're doing. And uh, the challenges that I see are multi-composites and anisotropic materials. And we do that using polyelectrolytes. So this is something that is well known. Uh, and I won't go into the details. Basically, what we're doing, we're taking a charged surface. We are absorbing a char oppositely charged polyelectrolyte on top of that. And then we ca this is a self-limiting step in thickness. That's about one nanometer. And then we can wash and we can put the next component on. And we can do that a lot of times. In the end, I will show you examples where we do that a thousand times. And we are growing a vegetable garden out of it right now. So that will be at the end. Uh, and there can be components, can be anything. It can be the from the colloidal domain, so nanoparticles, nanowires, nanoplatelets, polyelectrolytes, protein, DNA, RNA, whatever you wish. Whatever is slightly charged and other methods will also work. Uh, other interactions, other chemical interactions will work as well. And we are following basically the rules of polyelectrolyte complex formation. We take a polyanion, a polycation, we release the counterions, we form the complex, but we're doing that stepwise and we're doing it at an interface. So uh, the, everything here fits to the community, polyelectrolyte concentration, pH, charge density, molar mass, chemical structure, ionic strength, temperature, these are our parameters. So it can go to infinite actually. And here are some of the things that we can make and some of the things that I will discuss. This is actually a film made from cellulose nanofibers. This is a film made, among other things, from titanium particles for catalysis. This is made with gold particles for plasmonics. This is a 50 nanometer freely suspended film. Uh, this is a, this type of film onto which we can carry out uh, mechanical measurements. So this is uh, biodegradable artificial steel, I will show you. This is uh, pl for plasmonics. This is with silver nanowires. This is on textile. This is on silicon wafers. And this is around nanoparticles. So basically, the wonderful thing about layer-by-layer -layer technology is you can put it around nanoparticles, you can make nanoparticles part of it, and you can put it onto any large surfaces. So whatever you have, you can make the same film on many, many different surfaces. And this is just another impression of the variability that we have. You can change nanoparticles from layer by layer, polymers from layer by layer. You can work on pattern surfaces. You can change the size. So it's, it's going to infinite. And let me start with the mechanical properties. So in, in, in classic material science, uh, we have basically a stress-strain diagram where we have an elastic deformation. We have a yield here, a yield point, and the plastic deforms. And then we have plastic behavior. And materials that go like the red one, glass, strong and brittle, uh, blue, steel and wood, strong and tough, and uh, dough, uh, weak and ductile. So. That was a science paper by Nick Kodov. Nick was a colleague, and he did layer-by-layer -layer deposition back in, I think this is 2007. 
And uh, this was modeled after the abalone shell, which, by the way, is a delicious uh, animal that you find here in the, in the Chinese cuisine. And it has this brick and mortar structure, as you know. And uh, this structure was basically reproduced by layer by layer by Nick back then. And what I want you to look at is this figure. So here we have the natural model. We have the, uh, model that the, the film that Nick made. And he ends up with a tensile strength of 400 megapascal. And uh, now that's something to beat. And that's something to beat. Here we still have a mineral material. So Nick used Montmorillonite, which is fine. But we set out, say, can we beat the figure? And can we use biodegradable components? So uh, back in, uh, I think this is 2008, we started with uh, a colleague from, uh, two colleagues from Sweden, Lars Woberg at KTH, and uh, uh, Tom Lindström, who is at Inventia uh, in, 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 in Stockholm, to make multi-layer films on uh, surfaces with, in which one component is a uh, nanocellulose. The nanocellulose is charged. This makes beautiful films. And uh, we started to cover it on larger surfaces by spraying. So by spraying, you can actually go to really huge surface areas, and you can deposit that very well. So instead of dipping, you do spray cycles. And then uh, we can actually make films that are really large. This is now biodegradable, macroscopic films. This is about three microns. And, uh, uh, we can do the tensile strength. So stress strain, in that case, as a function of pH, well, we get up to 250. Remember the value from Nick? This is not enough for a science paper. In science, you need at least 400 megapascal. So, but this is already quite interesting, because what we're doing here, essentially, is we're doing a charge variation on the nanocellulose. And what it means is uh, we are changing the charge density on the nanocellulose, which means I can vary the uh, anion cation ratio. And you see by this, we can already fine tune the mechanical behavior uh, f from low cellulose content at pH 11 at high cellulose content at pH 8. And we go from 440 to 206 megapascal on average. And the Young's modulus is increasing this way. And the toughness is increasing this way. So not enough. So what else can we do? Well, we can actually try to make materials anisotropic. Uh, so we are not only spraying now against a receiving surface with a rectangular. So this is like you apply your classic perfume. Um, and then you get a disordered film. Color represents order. Each color stands for a certain direction. If you see red, it means the objects are ordered this way. So, and this way you achieve by spraying at a flat angle. And then the shear will actually cause a surface flow. And the surface flow is orienting the fibers. And uh, the fibers are, can then be used. So how do we do that? And how does that work? And, um, are there any advantages of this? So this is a comparison uh, of different techniques to align things. Uh, you see that most of it is heavy equipment. Magnetic fields very nice, but you need large uh, uh, machines. And you can do it only on small areas. And with the spraying that we have been developing, the grazing incident spraying, we can cover large areas. We can control the density. We can control, basically, the uh, monolayer formation. The com we have a complex architecture available. And we have, basically, no payoff. So the things that other methods are not good at, uh, we don't, we, we are, it's not a problem for us. And then uh, by doing the ordering, you can see that you can make several different components. It's not restricted to anything. We can use silver nanovirus, zinc nano, uh, rod, zinc oxide nanorods, carbon nanotubes, or the cellulose microfibers. So this is basically the order parameter that you're seeing here. And now look at these figures. If we are pulling uh, orthogonal to the perpendicular to the fiber direction, we get 200 megapascals. If we are pulling on the random, we are getting roughly up to 300. That's our best values. And if we are pulling parallel to the fiber direction, 
We are now at 500. This is not yet published, but uh, you remember that uh, Nick Kotov was at 400. And this is basically now a material that is biodegradable, that is available on large surfaces, and that can actually um, uh, be applied to, to many, many things. But still, can we get better than that? And this is now what the last years of my career will, I will be doing. This is now a paper that came out in 2012, and it says the Stomatopod Dactyl Club, a formidable damage-tolerant biological hammer. And that's where we really would like to go. And for this, I think I'm going to show you a movie. And uh, this is about bio-inspired anisotropic materials, transparent, biodegradable, self-healing steel. So let me see if the sound is working. Hopefully, yes like the land living insect this critter is in a class of its own these fists are looking for a fight hinged arms with clubs for boxing gloves unfurl as fast as a 22 caliber bullet impossible to see at normal speed prey is quite literally smashed to pieces it's the fastest move in the ocean and if you're that quick, you'd better have accurate eyesight. So what this animal does, it's actually hunting with a club. It, it hunts about 50,000 times in its lifetime. And during this, it accelerates the club to supersonic speed underwater that causes cavitation and that causes electrical discharge. And yet the material that it uses for that stays intact. And uh, I show you what it actually does. That's the second movie. There we go. And so this is the prey. Move your crab. Bang! Trigger. Pull it out there. Yeah, that's crazy. So, actually. Uh, the, the structure has been revealed in, in, in a paper. And for this, the crustacea here have a structure in which chitin fibers are in a helical conformation. And that's now a challenge, because materials uh, like that cannot be made artificially with a pitch in the micron or submicron range. Macroscopic, you can make them. And uh, what we are now interested in, this is, an, this is an electron micrograph, this is a model of the structure, and you see that they can have actually double pitch materials and, and so forth. And these are now mechanically among the most interesting materials you can make. The disadvantage of that is it is damned hard to prove what you have. That took them so long to develop these things. So in order to go there, we, we thought that once we have a helix, we should actually be able uh, to use materials that react better to polarized light. And uh, this is, would be linearly polarized light, and this would be uh, circularly polarized light. And we did not start out with the cellulose. That's our next goal. But we started out, actually, with uh, materials that are here that are silver nanowires. And silver nanowires show plasmonic behavior. And with the plasmonic behavior, uh, basically what you have, you have a small metal particle. And in that metal, uh, the electrons can move. And that gives rise to what is called as a surface plasma. And uh, here you have such a typical silver nanowire. And that it has two plasmons. You see a plasmon which is going this way. That plasmon is, of course, at higher energies because the distance here is small. So that is moving in an electrical field, or the, in, in an, and, and that gives you a short wavelength peak. And then the plasmon can also move this way. And that is something that occurs at far longer wavelengths, so about here. And uh, when you do that, now we are spraying silver nanowires. Spraying orthogonally gives you random order. Blue stands for that direction, green for that, red for this. And here, if you're spraying this way, you are getting very well aligned system with some disorder. And uh, that can uh, actually, so you see actually the color code for that. So purple is this way, 
and uh, yellow is this way, and you see very little yellow, and you see most of it uh, in that direction. And then what we, what we have made first is what we call a wavelength-dependent optical polarizer. So you see the short plasmon, which is this one, is high when the long plasmon is low, and this one is low, then the other one is high. So you see basically at 1500, which is telecom wavelength, we have this polarization, and at 350, this is the short plasmon, we have this polarization. And that can, and hey Bing, who, who is actually the person who, who made this first material first, he is right now working at NTU. And then, of course, you get all kinds of effects. This is a little bit bothering for, uh, boring for the community. Uh, you get new peaks. This is from plasmon coupling. But all of this falls into what people in the field expect. And uh, it's actually behaving more or less like, like we would like. However, the orientation is not that simple. And uh, here I need to know how, how I'm doing in time. Because I, yeah, I think I'm, we are fine. So uh, basically, we have tried actually with uh, Andreas Ferry at Dresden to optimize the orientation of the nanowires. And Andreas makes uh, wrinkled surfaces. He actually uh, has an instability on the surface, which gives parallel wrinkles. And you see the profiles of the wrinkles here. And on a normal surface, if we don't do much, uh, the, the nanowires go in random. And on a wrinkled surface, they help. And now what we did study here is actually how the nanowires orient when they are sprayed onto a wrinkled surface. So the wrinkled surface would cause the nanowires to go parallel to the wrinkles, and the spraying would cause the nanowires to go perpendicular to the wrinkles. So green is the spray imposed uh, deposition, and red is the wrinkle imposed deposition. And what we will do with the electron microscope, we will take a journey over one centimeter in electron microscopy, and we will go from here to here. So we will move the electron microscope here, and that's a, the that's a next movie that I'm going to show. So we are starting out uh, basically at the site where the first uh, nanowires arrive on the surface. So this will change in color in a moment. So we are starting to move with the electron microscope. There are funny things to note. Uh, you see, for example, that the nanowires are selectively absorbed. Uh, now red means we have close to the nozzle, we have this direction, meaning here the nanowires are oriented by the wrinkle surface. Very, very surprising. Then we move further. And uh, you see more and more green. Green means they are following the spray direction. So the, the wrinkle direction is this way. The spraying direction is this way. And the further we move out, we see more and more green coming. And we see less and less red. So where this, yeah, and we are further away from the spray, actually, we are having more influence of the spray orientation. That is something that is, in the community, a very interesting discussion. Because uh, theoreticians argue since uh, tens of years, if in a shear you get parallel or perpendicular orientation. And here we have a system, I think, where we can actually decide that answer. Uh, and this will now move much faster. And you see if we are really about 10 millimeters away, uh, the, the wrinkles are completely organized parallel to the spraying direction. And that is what we are actually, what we want to do. And that is what we want to control. So now we have roughly uh, went up to uh, 12 uh, uh, millimeters. And here it is completely spray dominated. And that is actually uh, what we are interested in to see. And now we would like to build up several layers of these. So to, according to the scheme, we are now using uh, LBL technology to make several of these layers. And we built then polymer layers on top of these and more of the silver nanowire layers. And that you see now, they are all parallel. This is the, from the ends, you can see a few layers of more, more, and more. And here is the plasmonic response of these and so forth. So that is all working. Here we have a direction of the layers which is all in the same sense. And uh, 
remember we were looking for chiral materials. The little mantis shrimp actually had a chiral orientation of the fibrils. So that is a large, what we are doing now is we are spraying one layer in this direction and the next layer in the, opposite, in the orthogonal direction. And that means uh, here we are starting out at the large scale electron micrograph. So you see 200 microns, the surface is pretty well covered. And then we are zooming in and you see the top layer is oriented this way with some disorder. And the layer below is oriented this way with some disorder. And that is actually one of our first examples uh, and I use it as an illustration. In reality, our systems are much better than that. And uh, now we have to compare ourselves with this system. So uh, Andrea Alou, uh, back in 12, 12, 2012, he made na by nanolithography little metal helices, where the first metal object oriented this way in the first layer, the second layer was oriented like this, third, four, five, and this is now a nanohelix made by incredibly expensive nanolithographic techniques. Uh, it costs a lot of money to do this. This is uh, E-beam deposition, anisotropic etch, metal liftoff. It can be done on the square micron. And you get a certain response in transmission uh, of the wavelength. And what we can do now is we can do the same thing with a left-handed helix, a right-handed helix, and uh, with the same nanowires, and we can do it now over the square meter. And this is all uh, non-published. So basically, the, left, the right handed helix would be this way, next layer this way, third layer this way, uh, left handed first this way, second this way, third this way. So these are, these are mirror images of each other. And, uh, what you get is a CD, so this is uh, circular dichroism, and I will not go further into the details, but this is a film of 200 nanometers total thickness, and uh, we get here up to 8,000 milli-degrees from a film which has 200 nanometers thickness. This is what people in physics call giant circular dichroism, and it's normally only observed with highly specific materials, but what it shows is that our technique allows to very efficiently build helical structures with different materials, and this is where we want to go in the next years, testing these materials for mechanical stability and see how much better or not the uh, mantis shrimp is when it hunts for prey. The end, I promise to uh, talk about ongoing research in collaboration with a team at Navarra in, in Spain, uh, Cesar Aguado, who is, who is here, and Francisco Aregui. And um, this, is, this is something completely different. I have a transition slide to prepare you for this. Um, if we actually have a surface here, and we look at a polyelectrolyte, and this is a pure polyelectrolyte film, polyanine, polycadine film. We expect the film to be smooth. The granularity is from the metal evaporation. And here is the surface, and here is the air, and that's what we expect. And this, in our hands, and in, in the hands of other people, is something that is very reliable. You can make optical interferometers, even mass production. This is a team at Swaya Technologies, a startup based in California, that was bought by 3M. Uh, the apparatus is basically multiple dipping. So here you have anion solution, you have a drying system, you have a rinse solution, you have a drying system, cation solution, drying, ri drying, rinsing, then it goes back around. So that's a prototype. This is the machine that is at 3M which is running this on the large scale. Here you see the product. It's an optical interference filter which blocks infrared. This can be glued to the window of your car, can be glued to your building, and it will keep the heat out. And uh, that's the team of Swaya. This is the representative, Krogman, of Swaya at a scientific conference. That is one with, this has blue, yellow color. This has red color. This is a flexible plastic made this way. So, we, we, we typically like to see films smooth, equal thickness, optical quality coatings. Welcome to our nano-vegetable garden. 
This is a film made by dipping in the lab of Cesar. And in the beginning, we have little columns forming. This is a film at about 20 layer pairs. This is 200 nanometers. So the columns have a width of about 250 nanometers. And these little broccoli here, this is now at 80 layer pairs. And you see that they are budding. You see that they all have the same height. And if you continue, uh, we get here to 15 microns in height, 500 layer pairs. And uh, we have really nano vegetables growing. They have all the same height. And we are completely helpless with respect to finding an explanation on structure formation of pure polyelectrolyte solutions on that length scale. So what we have, actually, you see that the columns here are fusing. This is something we understand. Um, so basically, when the columns reach a certain height, and what I have not yet told you is that these columns are actually one of the polymers makes the columns soft. Then they swell, and the other polymer is coming into the surface from the second layer. They collapse the columns, and they bring them back to a harder state. So basically, one polymer drives it to a coarser state almost, and the other polymer drives it back to a more rigid state. So, and the budding occurs in between. And then the, during the soft state, the columns can fuse if they touch each other. And this is what you see in the next slide. So uh, here is your, color, your broccoli at the same height. Then you see also that columns, this is from the top, so the columns bent over. And when they are getting soft and they touch, then they can fuse and build larger columns. But the basic element and the big problem is we have basically 250 to 300 nanometers length scale. And there is no physical law that I'm aware of that would give you structure formation in such a system on that length scale. So uh, any help and any discussion uh, it, there is welcome. We do have a poster for this where we give you much more details on the, on the process and where you see actually what we already know, how salt influences that and how the Hofmeister series plays with that and so forth. And with that, I hope that I have not been over time and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. It's very nice to hear these uh, things that you have been able to develop. Um, the paper is open for discussion. Please, comments and questions. Professor. Yeah. Okay. Do we have a mic? Yes, I'm Yes, uh, I'm not going to ask you that, but how the, the broccoli structure could be made. You will get the microphone. But did you measure any mechanical or optical properties of the broccoli like um, films? Well, the, the, uh, for the, the broccolis are not uh, actually there. The, the, the present idea is to understand the structure formation. Because what we believe actually is that uh, these are non-equilibrium structures. And uh, we believe that we have. Uh, uh, polyelectrolyte uh, behavior uh, in practice. And we do simply not understand the rules for that. Uh, so the, the, the broccoli uh, themselves, we cannot look at mechanically because they are very small. So we could look at a film, but this is not a continuous film. And I, in my feeling, it would be a very difficult experiment to support that film on a a uh, suitable surface for doing a mechanical measurement. But of course it could be, it could be interesting, yes? But you may have a continuous layer. Test, the test. No. Uh, we ha what we see is we have a very thin polyelectrolyte film in the beginning. And uh, the, or we could build a film in the beginning, but then we would see the properties of that layer. So what we believe here, the nano broccoli would probably be good for large area lotus effect. And uh, this is a self-patterning film. 
So uh, lotus surfaces are very expensive to make. And you typically, people are talking about templating, are talking about very, very different things. And this is actually uh, a lotus surface on the large scale that can be put onto any object, independent of its shape and its size. So that is basically the driving force for that. But we have to understand the rules that govern it. And I think the rules are the rules that are the rules of uh, a large part of the community here. More questions? Yuri? Uh, really fantastic Quebec. Uh, very simple method. Uh, you didn't tell at all about uh, the velocity of your stream, of distance. Uh, yes. Be because this is very important parameters. Yes. And the search will depend strongly. Yes, it will. It, it's, uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, the velocity is hard to measure. We are currently doing this. What we have measured is the velocity of the droplets of water that are arriving on the surface. And we know that we can control the speed of the droplets in air. This is what we have measured at the present time. And this ranges from about 120 meters per second. Then the slowest ones are on the order of 20 meters per second. And how it depend on the distance? This is, this is the... This is the funny thing. If we are on a smooth surface, we are aligning everywhere parallel to the spraying direction. Mm -hmm. But if we are on the ripple surface, then actually close to the nozzle where the speed is highest, uh, we ha the, the, the wires follow the ripples. And very far from the nozzle where the speed is slower, they follow the spray. And this is also something where we have tremendous difficulties to understand that. But I think that, uh, again, with the help of a few colleagues, maybe we can solve the problem before I retire. I'm not yet sure. So this is so one of the methods of regulation of uh, the anisotropy and structure of this layer. Yeah. This is very important. Yes, 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 yes. That's certainly important. We have another system, titanium dioxide, nanorods. And they are close to the nozzle. We are disordered. And far from the nozzle, we are ordered. So we are seeing the same thing with two different components. And I think for the silver nanowires, uh, the ordering tendency is probably stronger further away. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, there was one question over there. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> you, you mentioned the lotus effect. Uh, so uh, did you make any contact, contact angle measurements or, uh, on your broccoli uh, well, structure? Or? That depends what uh, Cesar did some uh, after making them hydrophobic. But uh, the, that depends on the treatment that you apply afterwards. More or less, the contact angles of the native polymers as we make them are on the order, they are, uh, I would say, around 40, between 20 and 40, depending on which polymer is at the end. Um, but uh, when, you, when you make them hydrophobic, and there you can go to several different techniques, you can reach over 130 easily. Maybe just a quick uh, yes. question um, about the wrinkling uh, experiment. Very nice, by the way. If you stretch the, the PDMS uh, while spraying, uh, uh, what, what do you see, actually? Oh. If you spray, I mean, you can tune the... the yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The we, are, yeah we are, we are very spraying. happy that we have a single question to answer at the present time, and that's the static surface. Of course, we could go to the stretched surface as well and look at different ripple distances. But that is not yet something that we are, well, that we, we would, we have to start first with the other things and do a, a better understanding. Because when you're opening the, the ripples, actually you are changing also surface chemistry. Yeah, so the, uh, the ripples are made in a, in a silica surface when you oxidize the PDMS on the surface. And when you stretch them, you expose PDMS. So you're exposing uh, hydrophobic uh, regions. And that, at the present time, we want to do in a more controlled way. So we are doing a, a, a flat surface, and we are doing the hydrophobic, hydrophilic patterns first on a flat surface. And then we can go to the other one. But that's something that we're also, that we're also interested in. It's a very important question to, to, to work on this. So the, the, the relative orientation is 90 degrees. Uh, right. Can you control it? Maybe you said The relative orientation is always the orientation of spraying. So you 
can control it. If, uh, if uh, it's a question how well I orient my surface, and I can do I can do any helix with any pitch, uh, provided I can actually. Uh, uh, the, 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 let, let, me, let me tell you where the biggest error is coming from. Um, the nozzle has an opening angle of about 12 degrees. So 12 degrees is something that we have yes, to fight yes. with. That gives us a little bit of variation of, this, of, the, of the stream on the surface. But uh, there are nozzles, we are working on nozzles which confine the spray jet better and uh, uh, I think we can control it within five degrees. So five degrees, and then you can build up whatever you like. Okay, thank you. Okay, we thank you again, Piero, yeah, and uh, take.